If you were to enter into a contract, you would enter into a mutual agreement that carried obligations. If you enter into a covenant, that covenant is an agreement between more than one person, two or more persons or parties. The promises of God are revealed in the scriptures and they're conditioned upon certain terms on the part of man, such as obedience, repentance, faith, and many others. Commitment. When you look that word up in the dictionary, it means a promise or pledge to do something. It's an open declaration of adherence. In other words, sticking to or clinging to the declaration. Once you make a contract, a covenant, or a commitment, you are obligated to carry through with that commitment. This is in relationship to God. You must have an open heart and an open declaration to stick to that agreement. And it must become the most important thing in your life. Matthew chapter 24 verse 13 makes a statement. Quote, He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. It is an enduring commitment. There is no way that you can endure unto the end unless you place Jesus Christ as first in your life. And first, you must prove that He exists. You must prove that He means what He says and He has the capacity to carry out His promises. In Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get you out of your country, from your kindred, from your father's house, unto a land that I'll show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless you, and curse him that curses you. And in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Notice now that Abraham had been told by God, had is past tense. God at one point in time told Abraham to leave the area in which he was living at that present time. Now drop down to verse 15 to 18. The princes also, or I'm sorry, chapter 15, verse 18. Chapter 15, verse 18. In that same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto your seed I have given this land. It was as good as done, even though it didn't occur for several hundred years. From the river Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. God began to make a covenant that eventually was expanded throughout the Bible until finally Abraham and his descendants would become heir of the entire world. Every person who would become a descendant, either racially or who accepted Jesus as the Christ, the one and only Savior of Almighty God, all those individuals would be grafted into Israel as if they were home-born. And there would be no racial barriers. And those individuals all would be able to receive the inheritance of this world. In Romans 4.13, notice what the New Testament says in relationship to this. For the promise that he should be heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law but through the righteousness of faith. The righteousness of our faith is that we believe that Jesus will forgive all of our sins when we break the covenant, the contract, the agreement, and even on occasions when we break the commitment that we make to God. He will forgive us if we will return and get on the right track and make sure that commitment becomes the number one point in our life. The Bible doesn't give much background on the events of Abraham and when Abraham left for Canaan. Abraham literally lived at the same time a great tyrant lived 
His name was Nimrod. He was the first organizer of peoples into a nation state. He was the first one to build a dictatorial society. But there is a book that does give some background of Abraham and in those days. It's called the book of Jasher. It's mentioned twice in the Bible in Joshua 10 verse 13 and 2 Samuel 1 verse 18. In the book of Jasher, it reveals that Nimrod ruled over the society of that day with an ironclad fist. He secured all the society under his rulership. As a direct result, because his very name in the Hebrew language means he rebelled, he began to build a tower to war against God. He wanted to ascend into the heavens because he was inspired by Satan the devil. And Satan's very goal was to ascend into the heavens and be like the Most High God. So he took an individual who had these same aspirations, who rebelled against God, the creator of all things, and allowed him to be the first ruler. Abraham was committed to God, not to the society of his day. According to the book of Jasher, Abram destroyed or revealed the ridiculousness of worshiping idols. He exposed the existing religious system of that day as false. As a direct result, Nimrod took him into captivity. Nimrod stoked the coals because in those days they had huge fiery furnaces and they would build up the heat with great intensity. And it was so hot that he took, they took Abraham and his brother, Haran. Haran walked the fence. He was a man who, whoever was in control, he sided with him. So if Nimrod was in charge, he would go along with Nimrod. But if Abraham, then he would go along with Abraham. So God saw the heart, according to the book of Jasher, of both of these men. And they were both cast into the fiery furnace. At a later time, someone noticed someone walking around. And they called to find out who it was that this intense heat could not destroy. Abram answered. But Haran was a pile of ashes and smoke. This man, Abram, was committed he had a covenant, a contract with God Almighty. God offered him the promise of the entire earth for his inheritance. And then later in the book of Hebrews chapter 2 verse 5 through 8, we see that all the universe is prepared for Abraham's seed through Jesus Christ our Savior. And once we receive our new glorified bodies, the universe is what we're to inherit, not just the earth. The earth is for today. The universe is for tomorrow. In Daniel chapter 3, there were other individuals who made a commitment to God and would not break that commitment. The Babylonians had take the tri taken the tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, known as the kingdom of Judah, into national captivity for 70 years. There were three young men, Daniel, and his three companions, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So four young men all together. But this story has to do with the three. They made a commitment to God. No matter what this pagan religion of the Babylonians required, they would not follow it. Notice verse 5 and 6 of Daniel 3. That at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, and it goes on and describes all the musical instruments... In other words, their band of that day, like the big band era of the 30s and so on. Well, any time this band began to play, all the inhabitants were to bow down and worship this great idol that Nebuchadnezzar had established. Verse 6, Whosoever falls not down and worships shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Abram had already experienced this. 
God said, get out of this area of the world and go into an area that I will give you as a possession. This was a type of the kingdom of God when those who were committed to the one and only living Jesus Christ of Nazareth would finally receive their ultimate reward, an eternal reward that could never be taken away. These men were committed to that same great God that had a covenant. Let's drop now down to verse 12 through 13. There are certain Jews, this is what the leaders of the Babylonian Empire said, whom you've set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded you. They serve not your gods, nor worship the golden image which you've set up. So these three men were now in positions of rulership in the Babylonian Empire. They were trapped by those who were jealous of their leadership. Verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar in his rage and fury commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Notice what's going to now happen to these men. And their response. This is very important for you and me. Because if we have a contract with God, He sets down the terms of the promise then we must fulfill the terms of the agreement in order for the promises to be given to us. If He sets down a covenant, we make the commitment, there is no turning back. God Almighty only will give us the promises if the terms of the agreement are met. Unfortunately, the religious community of today does not understand that. All they want is God to give the promises without us having to fulfill the commitment. That's not the way it works. He said He dealt with Old Testament Israel to give us learning as to how He deals with us. In ancient Israel, when they broke the covenant, He divorced them. He sifted them through the nation. Let's see what these men had to say. I'll drop down the middle part of verse 15. But if you worship not, this is the Babylonian government, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Here's old Nebuchadnezzar shaking his fist in front of these three young men saying, Who is this God you refer to? Nobody can take you out of my hands. I'll do with you as I please. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we're not careful to answer you in this matter. We don't even have to think. Why? Because the Holy Spirit of God will give you at that time what to say. Isn't that what Jesus said in Luke 21? When they bring you before councils, before synagogues, before world leaders... I will give you in that day what to say. Don't even think about it. Just open your mouth and I will give the words into your mouth as a testimony and a witness against them. Verse 17. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. That's power. Anytime somebody can protect you to where you will not even be singed as someone's cat was one time when lightning struck their garage. He can deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and He will deliver us out of your hand, O King. They were confident, weren't they? What about you and me? Can we speak with confidence? Have we proven from the pages of the Bible that this great God, Jesus Christ, can take care of us? That He's willing not only willing, but He has the power of the universe to back up His statements. Verse 18, But if not, be it known unto you, O King. In other words, we know He has the power. We know He has the strength of the universe. He's not a weakling like us. But if He chooses not to protect us, we will not serve your gods, nor worship the golden image which you've set before us. Are we going to face a beast system very soon? What's going to be our commitment? What's going to be our answer when they say, 
you will worship our leader as God. What's going to be our answer? What are we going to choose to say? Verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury. What do you think the beast is going to do? He's going to be given power by Satan the devil. Because Satan will be cast down out of the heavens. He'll not be there accusing us anymore. He will be probably possessing this person. And he's going to be mad. There's anger going to be fomented that has never been known to human beings before. And when you and I say we will not worship you, you're not God, you are of the devil. What do you think he's going to do? And the form of his visage was changed. He was so mad his countenance changed. And he ordered them to stoke the coal seven times hotter. Verse 20. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hose, their hats, with their garments. And were cast into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent. I mean, he was so mad at these men because they wouldn't worship his image. Participate in this pagan religion. That he was so mad at them. He said, get them in that fire. Don't delay. And the furnace exceeding hot. The flame of the fire slew those men that actually took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and threw them in there. But something happened in the narration of this story. The king began to look to see how quickly they were burned up. Verse 24. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto the counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? Well, they answered, Yes. He answered and said, Lo, I see four Men loose and walking in the midst of the fire. And the fire is not hurting them. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. What is your commitment going to be? Are you going to invite the Son of the living God into your life for divine protection? They did. They stood their ground. They had a commitment. They wouldn't break it. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come forth, come here. They did. Verse 27. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men upon whose body the fire had no power, nor was their hair of their head singed. Will we have a commitment so that the living Jesus Christ will not let the least hair of our head fall on the ground without taking notice? If He's our God, and if we're committed to Him, and if we're committed to obeying the covenant which He's given to us, this is the kind of protection we will receive and we can expect. Verse 29. Therefore I, Nebuchadnezzar, make a decree that every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces. You think this man got semi-converted? He was terrified of such a God that had power that no fire could burn them and even scorch them or singe them. And there wasn't even a smell of fire on their garments. Yes, this great God can deliver. And Nebuchadnezzar finally admitted how great this God is that can deliver after this sort. How committed are you to this God? Is He only a dream, a figment of our imagination? Is He only a mental thought? Or have we literally gone to this great God in time of sickness? And call for the elders of the church to anoint you with oil. And if you live too far away, sin will send you an anointing cloth. And let this great God prove His greatness. 
Do you strive with all of your heart to obey your contract? To meet your obligations? Do you meet them with your mind? Do you, when you see yourself faltering because of the work of the flesh, do you cry out to this God and say, Help me. I'm in a fiery furnace that's in my mind. Every sin that I commit is against you and you only. Will you help me? Will you help me to meet the commitment I've made to you? I'm weak in the flesh. I cannot do it. But with your aid, your comfort, your divine intervention, I can meet every obligation of my contract. How committed are we? Does even the smallest part of God's way of life have meaning to us? Or do we make God's ways a multiple choice? I'll pick this one and choose what, when, and how to obey God on my own terms. Or the moment you see wrong enter into your life. Do we have the submissive attitude that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had? We know our God will help us. Do we submit and say, Father, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to break your law. I didn't mean to displease you today. You're my Father and my God. I only want to obey you. If you try with all of your heart, humble yourself before your God, what can you expect? Of him. I think that's only fair, don't you? If there is a great God that says, I want you to obey me, and here's the rules, here's the regulations, here is the contract, isn't it only fair to find out what we're going to get out of it and what he'll do for us? Remember, if you commit yourself to God and live the very best you can. You should be able to commit your life to Him. And you should be able to expect something in return from Him. In Acts chapter 2 verse 38. Notice what you can begin to expect from God. Acts 2 verse 38. On the day of Pentecost, the people heard the message which Peter delivered and the others who were there. They were all preaching... And finally the people began to ask, well, yes, I understand this. He's our Savior. What should we do? Verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Notice what he said God will begin to do to you and for you. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He promises the Holy Spirit. Why would He do that? What purpose is the Holy Spirit in your life? He gives us the answer. Because the people in Old Testament times could not obey God. They couldn't obey the covenant. And in Hebrews 8 verse 7 and 8, it gives us the answer why He will give the Holy Spirit. For if that first covenant had been faultless, so there was something wrong back there. And yet Psalms 19 verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. So since God's law was perfect, it must have been something wrong with the people. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, the people... He said, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. As a direct result, he said that he would give them his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit would give them the spiritual power to keep a spiritual law. When in previous times, here were physical human beings expected to keep a spiritual law. And it was impossible. And you and I know it too. We try to keep God's law to perfection and we fall short of it and we fall on our face and we realize without God's Holy Spirit to give us the power, we cannot do it. God's Holy Spirit was given to begin to correct 
the situation. Notice verse 10. For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God. Then verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. If God's going to be so committed to you and I in this new covenant, and He's going to say, you must obey me, not just from the physical activities, but from the heart, then He is responsible for providing a way for us to fulfill the contract. Do you and I think God is so awful that He would make a contract with us and know that it was impossible for us to keep it? That's sadism. No, God has made a way so that you and I can meet the terms of the agreement. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, He said He would put His laws into our hearts and He would write them in our mind. And in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 3, He tells us how. For as much as you, Christians now, are manifestly declared to be the epistle, you're to be an open letter of Christ. He is to write His way of life inside of your heart so that when somebody comes up and meets you, they're to be able to read you like a letter. And they're to be able to read all over you. This person is different than anybody I've ever met before. How is he going to do it? We're to be an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God. Not in the tables of stone like Old Testament Israel. God wrote with His own finger the Ten Commandments and gave it to them. But in the fleshy tablets of the heart, He would write inside of each one of our hearts and mind the laws that require us to be obedient to. He will write them in our minds by the Holy Spirit. And it will take time for us to have those written in our hearts and mind. Just like it takes time to sit down and write a letter. And then you go back and reread it and you edit it to make sure all the words are spelled correctly. The punctuation marks are correct. So God is writing perfect character inside of us by His Holy Spirit. And it takes time. But you must have a commitment. How can you act haphazardly toward the great God that created all things? If you don't have a commitment, you will never change your life. You will never allow the living Jesus Christ to begin to write His laws into your heart and mind. In 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. Notice what you can expect God to do for you. Verse 1 and 2. My little children, those these things write I unto you that you sin not. In verse 8 to 10 of chapter 1, he says that if anybody on the face of the earth says that we have no sin, we make God a liar. We all sin. Verse 1, chapter 2. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with a father. We have someone there in the heavens who is pleading our cause. Jesus Christ, the righteous the is a definite article. It's an adjective and it's a definite article. He is the righteous one. There is no other human being that's drawn breath that is righteous. I'm not righteous. You're not righteous. We've all sinned at least one time or we would deserve eternal life and we would not need the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But He is the only one that's ever lived to perfection. Notice what he said now in verse 2. He, Jesus, is the perpetuation for our sins. And not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. We can absolutely expect Jesus Christ to forgive every sin that we've ever committed. 
And we have someone to plead our case. The penalty for sin is death. For all eternity. And yet when Jesus Christ writes His laws into our hearts and our minds, when we slip and we fall, then He will forgive every one of those sins. He will offer His own shed blood on the mercy seat in the heavens before the Father. And then all of our sins will be erased. And we will not have one sin attributed to us. That's good news. Turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Verse 21 and verse 22. Then came Peter to Jesus and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say not unto you until seven times, but until seventy times seven. In other words, we are to be unlimited in our forgiveness of our brethren, if someone is sincere. Now, you and I should be able to read after a certain number of times whether that person is sincere or not. If they're constantly doing the same thing with a harsh attitude with an attitude of, I am always right. You know, there comes a time when you have to turn your back on that person. Have nothing to do with them anymore. Even though you can forgive them, you can love them, they have no love in return. So why keep standing there and keep taking it time after time again? But if they're sincere, we are to forgive them with an unlimited number of times. Verse 23 to 35, Jesus gives us a parable. Notice what he says now. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which takes account of his servants. And he goes on and shows that he gives them talents. Then he goes on into the heavens and sits at the right hand of the Father. He's gone a long time. And when he returns, he's going to take account of his servants. And those who have overcome, they will be rewarded. Notice now one man owed an, the king, we might say, a great deal of money. He didn't have money to pay this particular king. So he says to this king, look, forgive me the money I owe. I owe you about five million dollars. I can't pay it. Will you forgive me? See, they had debtors' prisons. If you couldn't pay your debt and you couldn't work it out, then you went to prison and spent the rest of your life until you died. This great king said, look, I forgive you everything that you owe. I'll not hold it against you. Go your way. Be at peace. Start a new life. Then another man came to that man that was forgiven such a great debt. This man came and said, look, I only owe you $100. Will you forgive me that debt so I can get a new start in life? And the man said, put him in prison until he's paid every dime of it. How are you going to earn money in prison? You can't. That means the man would be in prison the rest of his life. So when the king heard of this, he said, Look, I forgave you all this massive debt, five million dollars, and you wouldn't even forgive a hundred dollars? Throw the man in prison. He deserves what he's going to get. He has no compunction, no love, no mercy. God Almighty will forgive you every single time you come to Him and ask forgiveness. God says forgiveness is predicated upon your willing to forgive someone else. I will tell you under the authority of God Almighty today, if someone sins against you and you won't forgive that person, when they ask sincerely from the heart, meaning it, you will never receive forgiveness again until you forgive. God says forgiveness is predicated upon being or being willing to forgive someone else. Anyone who holds grudges against one of God's elect, 
You are not forgiven from that moment forward until that grudge is released and forgiveness is given. But you can expect this from God. He will forgive you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, this is something else you can expect from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is as common to man. Every one of us have the flesh. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted. Above that you're able. God will never allow Satan and his demons to tempt you. He'll not allow any kind of fleshly temptation to come upon you more than you're able to bear it. You could overcome it if you draw upon the spiritual power of Jesus. And not give into our flesh. He says, Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that you'll be able to bear it. You can expect that from God if you will obey Him. In John 15 verse 7. John 15 verse 7. What else can you expect? If you will meet your obligation with, a, with your whole heart, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it will be done for you. You can expect God Almighty through Jesus Christ to answer your prayers. If you are fulfilling your part of the commitment, the contract, the covenant. Now our Father knows what's best for us. Sometimes we will ask to consume something upon our own lust. And you know, I'm a parent. I tell my children no when they pray to me. Prayer is nothing but conversation. It's a petition. And so when we go to our Father, if He sees it's not for our good and for our benefit, He will say no. But if it's for our good, He will absolutely answer that prayer in the affirmative. And the last thing I'll mention today. If you will keep your part of the contract and the covenant, God will give you the better promise of salvation, eternal life. That's all committed. And it's one of the better promises. In Hebrews 8 verse 6, it says, But now hath he, Jesus Christ, obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also He is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. And chapter 7, verse 25, gives us the answer as to what one of those better promises is. Wherefore, He is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto Him, come unto God by Him, seeing Jesus ever lives to make intercession for them. Brethren, if you... From the bottom of your heart, make a commitment to God. You make the contract, the covenant. You accept the terms and you live by them the very best you can. And when you fall, you petition God through Jesus Christ to forgive you. And He will give you the promises that He has stated. And brethren, my final scripture now is 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16 to 19. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Each one of us who have made the commitment, the contract, the covenant with God, judgment is upon us Every decision we make, your rulership position in the kingdom of God, your priestly position is being determined with every thought and action that you take. And if it first began with us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? If the righteous scarcely be saved, what shall the where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? 
Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well-doing as unto a faithful Creator. God Almighty will never let you down if you remain within the terms of the covenant.